three, two, one, and we're going. A prince, therefore, should have no care or thought but for war, and for the regulations and training it requires, and should apply himself exclusively to this as his peculiar province. For war is the sole art looked for in one who rules, and is of such efficacy that it not merely maintains those who are born princes, but often enables men to rise to that eminence from a private station. That's a quote from The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli, describing the ascension of Francesco Sforza from being a commoner to the powerful Duke of Milan. And today, here to share his story of ascension, Matt Foster is a penetration tester for coal fire, a focus on web applications, and brings with him over a decade of experience in information technology and security. And I can't think of anybody that's currently in a better position to give all of you advice on how to get into the field than Matt can is um, with relatively recent history. He, he has made the jump into penetration testing and very much congratulations to you, Matt. Thanks. It's quite an intro. I think everybody in the InfoSec community is going to watch this and say, who's this guy? Cause I don't really have like a footprint and I don't put out content. So it'll be, it'll be interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, um, for, for those that don't know you, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're about. Yeah. Um, so I am Matt Foster, um, been married. We'll start with, uh, kind of the order I go in is usually like faith, my family, and then also, um, uh, you know, kind of work history. So we'll, we'll go into that. Um, so with faith, I'm a Christian. Um, my entire career has been kind of is, has been fully authored by God. I've got to give him credit on that because, um, as we'll kind of get into with the story, I've had weird doors open that I don't believe were just chance or anything. Um, it's a combination of, you know, doing what I believe God's put me in the position to do as far as my career to provide for my family. Um, and then also, you know, doing the work involved to make sure I'm living up to that. Um, so there's that. Um, I've been married 12 years. We have two kids, um, a boy and a girl. So I'm, I'm busy with that. And then, um, you know, I got into really just information technology back when I was in high school there, the very inception of it, I guess, was um, we had a half day program at my school. Um, they called it Votech, but you could go over to another campus that wasn't related to our school um, and you could do some, some sort of training. There was a number of different things, but the thing that stood out to me was really just A plus certification. Um, I was interested in computers, hadn't really done a whole lot. So my junior year, I went over there half day and got my A plus certification and then went back as a senior the following year and got my net plus certification. Um, so then I started working in, um, uh, for a local newspaper doing just their IT, whatever work. Um, it could have been anything from like, um, you know, the associated press machine is down. So you need to cannibalize parts from this old, those old uh, Apple computers that had the translucent colors or whatever that were kind of an all-in-one. It was like a big deal back then, but a super big pain to get the hard drive out of. Um, so I started working on that and then um, just kind of progressed forward to today where, um, you know, now I finally work in uh, basically pen testing. It's, it's technically an application security consultant, um, but pen testing is a big part of what we do. So a lot of hops in the way, and we'll probably get into that as we kind of unpack a little bit more of this. Yeah, and you know that's um that's interesting that you started off at a uh, at a like a doing kind of general IT work for uh, for a newspaper, I believe. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, it, do you think that do you think that opportunity built a, a a strong enough foundation for you later on, or do you feel like? There was maybe some some self self study and self learning involved. Um, that helped establish a really good baseline for dealing with um, just your run of the mill troubleshooting. Not knowing about like I didn't know anything about newspapers, so you know I was just fresh out of like A plus. Okay, I know how to replace a motherboard and stuff like that. Um, 
you know, kind of looking back on it now, it was it was a really interesting point because I think there's some elements in there that kind of lead into pen testing. And that's, you know, you may not know anything about a given thing, so you've just got to get in there and figure it out. Um, so kind of the, the trade-off there was I was dealing with um, uh, Mac systems and had been exclusively trained on Windows. So you got to get in there and you got to, you know, the whole, there was a whole number of things that, um, similarities, but um, a lot a lot of different stuff and you know you're dealing with uh, more proprietary hardware because they control their whole supply chain and so there was some things that did work some things that didn't work um, they have this uh, program they use that i had never been exposed to i think it was called cork or something like that that's what they use to make the newspapers or you know build the digital blueprint for the newspaper before they send it off to press so yeah a lot of things that um really good foundation for that. Um, I realized I didn't want to stay in just that general area because it was only like two hours a day. Um, so I wasn't making hardly anything, but it was good. It was a good experience. Um, I left that job at some point though, to go work for a, uh, it was a local slot machine manufacturer. So we lived kind of in the neck of the woods where there was a number of casinos. Um, so there was a an organization that had moved into town and it was probably about 150 different people um, and uh, started out there in customer service, which it was a lot of over the phone stuff. So you're kind of working in the dark, dealing with um, employees, working at uh, the, the point of sale terminals, cashing out checks or not checks, but the uh, the vouchers or whatever from something that somebody won. Um, the almost slot text over the phone wasn't really a whole lot of things done over the computer. Maybe a little bit of remote work. Um, eventually, got up to level two support, which was a lot more um, managing servers and some of the proprietary software that uh, made up the the slot machine network, if you will. At um. At what point in your journey were were you like, you know what? I've kind of had enough of general IT. I, I want to start. I want to start breaking into stuff. When when do you think that kind of transition point happened for you? Yeah, that was a that was one of those opportunities that kind of walked my way and seemed a little bit funny um, because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I had left the slot machine company and went and worked in financial services. Um, Started out as PC tech and then made it over into uh, server sysadmin work. Um, doing a lot of maintenance stuff uh, on the weekends or being on call and rebooting random servers and things like that. Um, I knew I wanted to do more. I just didn't know what. It was kind of one of those situations where I felt like God was like, here you go. <laughs> um, so I had just randomly gotten a, an email from somebody that was a senior manager at the time. Um, it was basically an interview. Uh, so he said, yeah, come on down to the, the other office and uh, we'll meet and talk about this. And I had never really talked to this guy. Um, and he, uh, we went and met and he had a position open where needed to have somebody work on. At the time, my understanding of it was PKI and I had no idea what it was. Um, a number of other services kind of in that family, um, pushing out updates for all of the organization, a couple of other services, but uh, I accepted it on the spot because it sounded really cool. And then I went back to my desk and I Googled PKI because I had never heard of it before in my entire career and had no idea what it was and had no idea what I got myself into. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, okay, well, uh, you know, if he wants me to do it, it's got to be a step up from doing password resets on the weekend and rebooting servers and working the, the monthly maintenance. So um, that's when I knew I wanted to do more. And it was a situation of, I didn't know what to do. Um, so it was a, a thing where, you know, here's something you can do. So I got into that and that led to more uh, doing a lot more in public key infrastructure and really led into the bulk of my career, which was working with uh, just cryptographic technologies and a uh, wide range of things, probably not everything under the sun, but a huge family of, of those items that are everything that goes cryptographic, as I like to tell people. Well, that's really cool because, um, you, you know, you kind of described like a, a I, I wouldn't say... Um... 
I wouldn't necessarily say like a natural pro- progression, but it, it seemed um, like having having looked at your career history, it almost seemed like like it, there there was intent behind it, like some some careful foreplanning, um, because you know you you started out started out like just kind of doing like general you know sysadmin st- you know style of work, and then naturally just kind of you know escalated further into your PKI work, and now into consultancy. So. Um, it, it seems like, uh, I, I wouldn't say, I, I definitely wouldn't say like a pain-free path, but it definitely seems, seems like a, I don't know, like a congruent path, I guess, if that sort of makes sense as a way to describe it. Did you say that? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, working through those very, uh, beginner and baseline and foundational, if I want to put a word salad on it, um, all the base stuff, basically, um, working through all of those really helps you to roll into an offensive role. Um, just for instance, I was, you know, I was working through try hackney recently and there was uh, I'm working through the OSCP path, uh, the Jenkins instance on there. I managed the Jenkins instance for a long time. So I know that app inside and out, uh, just crushed that thing in 45 minutes, no big deal. And I just kind of laughed at the end of it because it was like, you know, that, that was interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, the next one after that, I'm stuck on that one. So that's a different side of the story. But, um, you know, as I get older in life, I'm 35 now and I started working on this kind of long arc of, of IT that rolled into information security. Um, looking at that now, you know, as I get older, I figure out a little bit more about myself and how to kind of approach things. Um, I think the thing I figured out about myself is if you give me like, here's a problem, I'll take it and I'll dissect it in several different ways and pull apart all the different parts and see how all the relationships fit. Um, and just go super deep on it. Uh, probably to the point of a little bit of OCD almost, um, the number of books that I've accumulated over the years is kind of part of that because it's just a, that's a self, uh, a self building habit, but it's, it's a little bit obsessive because I brought some books over here to kind of reference at some point, maybe, but, uh, yeah, I've got like my own, I wouldn't call it like a small library, but I definitely have more books than I know what to do with at the moment. It's helpful. Um, it's good for self-education for me. It was getting more into cryptography, uh, and, you know, I'd bought a number of mathematical books and realized, uh, some of those are pretty, pretty in depth. And so there, I realized at some point there was like a trade-off, like I can go and pull this apart and kind of understand it, but there is kind of a part in there that I need somebody else to probably discuss it with in order to figure out kind of the deeper things. But anyways, kind of back onto the, the path here. Um, yeah, it's really just uh, uh, my brain feeds really well into um, just kind of my career path, understanding things and, and just, you know, here's a new problem. OK, well, let's understand everything around it and just go deep on it. Uh, it's just kind of the way I've always approached those. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think it's helpful to definitely have books on hand because, you know, the, this might sound insane in you know our, our time of you know, 99.99% uptime connectivity everywhere. But, um, but, um, you know, I, I really do think that it's important to, to have books on hand because just in the odd event that you lose connectivity for any substantial period of time, like you still have a resource to go to and learn from. So when you say 99, are we talking four nines, five nines? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I couldn't help it. Oh uh, yeah, no, totally. I I buy books a lot. I prefer those over the digital copy just because it's it's something tangible that I can just you know, or hand out to somebody or just pick up and start reading. It it works out a lot better for me because I can also highlight on it. I mean, you can highlight on the iPad, but um, I don't know the the way I pull that material out and retain it works a lot better if I've got a physical book. So. Yeah. Well, you know, let's kind of expand on that a little bit. Um, 
Because you know, uh, I I know it's incredibly difficult to make make a jump in knowledge. Like even if you're already working, you know, in a blue team type role, you know, jumping over to the red side is there's a lot of knowledge there that one has to digest. And I'm kind of curious, what what were some resources that have helped you along the way? Yeah, so I think kind of starting at the beginning of that pivot, because that's that's really that's been the last couple of years. That's the more of the the foundational thing to me, or the the big thing, I guess. Um, it, for me, it was, okay, I'm kind of interested in this at some point, I realized, and I think I want to go do it. So I just went out and took, and I'm a little bit crazy in this way. I'm like, hey, here's a 100-hour training course. Let's just go do this. And so that's what I did for um, several several months after the kids went to bed as I just pull out the laptop and just start going through those videos. Uh, for me specifically, I had identified the... I think it was the penetration tester course in Cybrary. So on-demand training, their their uh, their course they have on that topic. Uh, that was really helpful because the thing where it kind of sunk into me after you got through a lot of the the boilerplate the boilerplate stuff was uh, a lab you had to get through, and so you had to download an exploit off of. Uh, um, exploit db and uh, i think it was a python script you had to update a couple things in it and run it and i had never done this before i had no idea what to expect and so i ran it and it just hung and so i sat there for about five minutes and another 10 minutes went by and i'm thinking did i get what are, what do you expect when you run an exploit and then what do you see so finally i got the wise enough to type in who am I? And it was uh, it was root at that point. Uh, oh, okay, this is great. Yeah. I'm and sorry, please continue. Gonna, oh, no, you're fine. Everybody's going to laugh at me because my voice just cracked, but whatever. <laughs> it, it was really kind of a, it was a big aha moment for me. Like, okay, I get this now. And this is, this is actually kind of addictive in a way. This is, this is fun. Uh, so I went through that entire course had completed majority of it. I think I got to like 97%. I had to put it on pause because I had some other stuff work related come up that I had to go pivot over and learn about. Um, I never went back to that. That's kind of the bad thing is that usually I get to like that 97% and I don't always think, you know, that last 3% is, is helpful or maybe something I need to go back and do. And, uh, you know, life moves on and then my, focus changes and so then I move on to something else but I got that 97% done and that you know just going through that and seeing if that was something you wanted to do that was a cheap way to uh, just answer that question the answer was obviously yes because that's what I do now so yeah um, you, you know among all of the resources that you've kind of um, dabbled in over the years um, do you think among those, uh, do you think there's been one that's kind of carried you in, to where you are now? Or do you, do you think um, it was just kind of like an amalgamation of all of those resources? Oh, man. Because um... for me personally, I, I can think of one specific resource that has absolutely carried me. Um, but I, I want to hear it. Get, get your perspective first. Sure. Uh, man. <clears throat> So I think the one thing that, you know, there's a couple different sides to that that help. I would say there's a couple of components to that. You know, one, uh, persistence. So never giving up to um, pursue what you're interested in or after. Uh, that's a weird thing to figure out how do you relate that to somebody. Um, that's a quality I want to instill in my kids is just to never give up. And that's really hard when hard when you're, uh, nine and, and six as they are. <laughs> uh, so I haven't quite figured out how do you relate that to somebody. Um, I think the other thing is just the, you know, that combined with the availability of resources that we have today. So like, I don't have a college degree. I have no certifications at this point. Uh, so in order to get into a space where I can actually do something like that, I have to absolutely prove that in a very small window, i.e. the interview. Uh, 
so you know using those online resources and studying and uh, just being diligent with time uh, it's kind of a balance too because i've got other things that need my attention and focus in other words my family uh so I've got to find time to, to focus on those things and figure out a way to intake them in a way that is um, actionable. So to kind of relate that into something, you can take a test and you can just word dump on the test and answer all the questions, or you can actually understand the material. Uh, something that one of those things working through IT over the years in the InfoSec, uh, one thing I picked up was kind of a strategy for figuring out a way to really understand the material. Um, I told somebody one time, it's, it's understanding how a machine works. So, or an engine, so like a mechanic can take a, a V8 apart and tell you every piece and a uh, thing like that. So a lot of times I view cryptography or penetration testing tactics and vulnerabilities is just an engine you know how do you take it apart and actually understand it and then relate to it uh, you know gas goes in the engine and into the pistons and combustion happens and that's what moves it you know i'm not a mechanic so that's about the end of where my information and analogy ends on that but um yeah so you know persistence and then just being a self-studier, those are the things that, that help me get through it. And then, you know, there's also that faith aspect that I mentioned, and that's that's around all that. I've got to do the work involved to make sure I'm, I'm doing the right things. So, you know, studying or uh, learning about things throughout time. Yeah. And I think that's important too. Um, I would absolutely say resiliency, you know, kind of that, that ability to persist in lieu of, you know, bad or um, unfortunate times, I, I believe, is a skill absolutely worth developing because yes. it, life, life is tough and so is this field. This field is very difficult. <laughs> yeah, and one thing I want to call out on that, that you talking about that actually reminded me, um, there's been a number of times I've applied for a job and I didn't get it, just straight out shut down. Uh, when I got into the financial services uh, business, um, uh, the first time I applied there, I went through a really long interview process and did get the job the first time. Uh, I don't, that's kind of something I'm looking back on it. I'm glad I didn't get that job because it was equivalent to a help desk. And I think I would have not been as happy with that. Um, instead, I got the job with kind of the, related organization which was the pc techs that worked out really well um because it was just a different dynamic uh, i think it was a good setting for me at the time my wife and i were newly married i wasn't on call uh, it was pretty straightforward and it was kind of something i needed at that point to establish some relationships in the organization understand how it works and where i wanted to go um things like that uh, but yeah, there's that. And then, you know, there's a number of other disappointments that I've hit along the way where it was like, I thought a thing was going to work out. And it didn't. Uh, you just got to keep pushing forward. Don't ever give up. Uh, something I was thinking about today uh, was uh, working on some of these labs like TriHackMe or, you know, just doing a penetration test. Uh, don't ever stop. Don't ever stand still. Just keep moving. Um, and that's something. You know, standing still seems worse to me than making a bad decision. There's probably some people that would disagree with me on that, and that's really okay. Uh, I would rather keep pursuing something and keep pushing forward. Even if I make a wrong turn, I still got the option to uh, go back and fix that. But you might discover more information going into that wrong turn that you wouldn't have discovered if you just stood in the same spot and stayed there with um you know deer in the headlights look so yep inaction has been a a, a theme on a, a lot of the content that i've created because uh, i know personally um inaction cost me about eight years between exam attempts for the oscp and if not for inaction, 
Um, you know, I, I really think if I had really bunkered down and studied and tried to learn the material at the time, instead of trying to, you know, just learn what I could for an easy pass, uh, if, if I had actually taken the time to put in the work and study, I think I absolutely could have passed within maybe three to six months after that first attempt. But inaction, inaction <laughs> led me down a, a, a very painful road personally, but it, it was very growing at the same time. So um, I, I don't necessarily regret that decision, but I, I do hear you. I, I think inaction is probably the worst thing that you can not do, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, kind of in your story, I think um, the growing part, you know, that may have had to happen in order to get you to where you are today. That's another part of it. Um, yeah, standing still can definitely be a, uh, it can be alarming. It can, it can really throw you off, uh, you know, working through something, whether you're doing a pen test or an engagement or, um, you know, just working through a lab. Uh, when I went back to the, if I go back to the beginning of working through um, try hack me or hack the box or any number of those ones out there where you can just uh, do your self study lab environment. Uh, I did for a while, I would work on something and I would get, you know, maybe like 25 or 30% of the way in to where I needed to be on that in order to capture the flags. And then I just get stuck and I didn't know what to do. And the answer that took me a while to figure out was um, not necessarily enumerate harder, which is what a lot of people say. Yeah, that to some degree, because you got to really pay attention to the details. But the thing I realized one day was this is a lab environment. I am doing this to learn. So I went and Googled you know, how do I beat this thing? Because I, I realized, you know, I've got all this like operational and crypto knowledge that can be applied in putting this service in place, but I don't have these strategies or this like playbook in my head around uh, handling offensive tactics. So, you know, that kind of relates to, uh, you know, like one side of the equation is, uh, if you're going to encrypt with symmetric keys, then you need to use a unique uh, IV or nonce each time. Otherwise, you're going to be subjecting yourself to a, an attack where somebody can actually uh, take multiple data and combine it um, and get plain text out of it. So that's a bad way. So that, that's, that's an implementation thing. Um, how that relates into offensive is, you know, I'm stuck. So I need to build up this playbook because it was literally a blank slate for me. Uh, I didn't know any of the, the things and I still don't know a whole lot of things. I, you know, I'm more than, uh, I've got a better base now than going back, I think three years ago when I made this decision for, you know, I want to go in the offensive space. Um, I got more in my head now, but just realizing, you know, if I just read a walkthrough and do all those things and take that and then learn from it, then I can use that later. That's the whole purpose of this lab. And so that was a pretty big point for me because I think in the back of my head, I thought I should know how to do this. But the real answer to that was, no, you don't because you've never done this before. This is a completely new, this is all new. So um, I think once I got over that, uh, that really helped. And um, something I did on top of that was also, um, I got like a notebook. I keep all my new things I learned. So there's like a section on Metasploit that I went through the other day and things like that. Uh, really trying to apply something that my Votec teacher, who was a big, um, he was a big uh, uh, mentor getting me started in information technology. Uh, something he told me that has always stuck with me uh, that has led to a compulsive note writing habit that fills uh, very Lord, I've got a lot of notebooks, basically. Anyways, you said write it. <laughs> My <obsidian laughs> I got a lot of vault goes like freaking like twenty layers deep now, so relatable. Gotcha. So yeah, you understand. But he said, you know, write it down. Yeah. Talk talk about it, read about it. But if you write it down, it will retain it. And he was right on with that. I thought he was crazy at first, but uh, uh, you don't know what you're talking about, Jr. Well, turns out he was right. Here I am. You know. Uh, 
half a life later and I'm still doing that. But, uh, yeah, so just getting over that and then, uh, using that as a way to just not, uh, not stay stagnant. Yeah. Uh, I, well, I really want to highlight like how important it is to take notes, you know, like oh, yeah. not, not just while you're studying either. Uh, you should probably be taking notes on the job. You should be taking notes. Uh, when you're doing you know, self-study, you should be taking notes. Even when you're doing challenges, like even if it's in a competitive sense, like if you're yeah. on, if you're on like a capture the flag event or you know, even something like like something high stakes like that, you should be taking notes because uh, th there's a lot that goes on uh, throughout your day. Like especially especially when when you start really you know deep diving into um, like the the different kind of subfields within infosec. Taking notes is extremely important. Uh, I don't know how many times, like, just random notes have, have saved me, both on the job and, you know, maybe studying for a course or taking an exam or something. Like, I, I can't iterate enough how much all of you need to start taking notes immediately. Yeah, go go out to Amazon. You can buy a notebook that, I think it's got somewhere around 250 or 300 pages. It's like $10. That's super affordable. Um you know, the one I use for all my offensive stuff, something something from Paper Ridge. I don't even know the brand, but that was the brand I went with because it was gray. So that seemed to make sense. They were out of red. It's because I was wanting it to be a red team notebook. Oh, yeah. oh but they were out. <laughs> <laughs> so I went with gray. Um, but yeah, it's super affordable. Uh, pens are cheap. Uh, yeah, very important. Help you retain a lot of stuff because a lot of times I'm not going to remember I can't tell you how many times I have to refer to that to look up something simple in uh, Metasploit. You know, I get in there. What was that command? And it could be something as simple as um, uh, show. And I'm probably forgetting it right now. But, you know, I forget what specifically it was. And, yeah, you could look up. You could pull up help on it and look through that until you find it. Or, you know, I know it's in my notebook on this one bookmark page. That's even quicker. So I, I, I'm going to forget stuff. Um, I, I, you, generally, I, rec I remember that there is a reference to something, but I don't remember the specific. So that's where my notes come in handy. Yeah, and, and um, you know, sometimes, sometimes you'll do a test so often. Um, I, I was actually just talking with a with a, a, a friend of mine um, in uh, in real life about this recently. That you, you may come across a, a situation where, um, you. Know, We'll say you're trying to achieve some sort of effect but because of a lack of knowledge in that area um you know notes are a great option but another great option is building labs so i'm kind of curious have um have you done any sort of labbing um, i would imagine you would you know just from your previous role but um I'm kind of curious if you do like um like a home lab of of any sort like that so that's kind of funny because I'm I'm really uh, I don't do a whole lot of that. I could see where you'd probably think that I would, um, but yeah, I just haven't done a ton of that. I do have one of those in Intel NUX, the NUC devices um, that I had thought about putting a little bit of a lab on there at some point or another. Just had never gotten around to it. Uh, for me, it's um, you know a lot of times. If you buy a subscription-based service like Try Hack Me, uh, you know they got VPN, they've got web-based Cali that you can use, um, and you know all the things that you would typically have in a lab is kind of all there to do. So that's a little bit more efficient for me. Um, my home network is really simple to be just completely frank, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which uh, you know it's. My brother-in-law also works in IT, and he's a lot more on the extreme with um, just some of the stuff that he does in his network. Um, and then, you know, we talk about work and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I just haven't found time to do that. And a lot of times it's because I'm kind of where I put my focus is, you know, one, doing my job throughout the day, and then two, trying to learn in the most efficient manner. So if I can pay like a $10 subscription fee a month to some service and then they take care of all that, that's a lot better than me trying to fix VMs that 
you know, 10 o'clock at night or something when my wife's wanting to watch the new Dexter or something. I'd rather be on the couch with her hanging out and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> watching TV. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm probably like way on the opposite end of the spectrum from most folks. Uh, a lot of people I follow on Twitter or whatever have some pretty cool labs. Mine's just super simple. <laughs> Well, I, I think this is a, a great opportunity to, to kind of you know, let you um, maybe flex some advice for people because there's a, a lot of people that will come to me and they'll be like, hey, I'm in this circumstance. Um, you know, I, I don't have a whole lot of experience. What can I do to get into the field? And, you know, the, the only perspective that I can really give them is mine. And I as much as I had fun and lots of adventures in the Air Force, I'm never going to recommend someone join the Air Force to get their start in information security. So, um, you know, if you had any recommendations for people to kind of replicate what you've done, because, you know, like me, I also do not have a degree. Um, I, I have a couple of certs, that's about it. Um, I have a couple of certs and some work history. So. Uh, you know, getting getting a perspective from you, uh, I think many people will find this incredibly valuable because, you know, not everybody has the time to go through a university program. Not everybody has the financial resources to go through a certification program, and you know, some people just have way too many obligations to do either of those. And I, I think getting getting some advice from you for for people to kind of replicate your success would be awesome. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I couldn't recommend going in the Air Force either. I was never in the military, <laughs> but, you know, just uh, my dad was in the, uh, um, uh, he was in the Army. I was trying to think of the specific area. Anyways, not matter. it doesn't matter, but he was in the Army. And so, you know, he'd, he'd talk about, you know, some of the just very generic and uh, menial things you had to do because you, you screwed up in a specific task and a, a specific uh, drill sergeant was just absolutely not happy and wanted you to know about it because, uh, you know, the meme comes to mind of the guy vacuuming the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, probably an e E5 or whatever. Anyways, um, uh, yeah, I couldn't recommend that. College is expensive. Um, the first thing that comes to mind really is there's nothing wrong with just taking an entry level job and working your way up. Um, it takes time. There, there's no doubt about that. Um, but that's totally okay because you doing that will help you learn uh, things down the road so much quicker because what you'll you'll kind of just develop a, or at least for me, I developed a um, internal routine for here's the new thing. Here's the process I go through to learn it. And then it becomes muscle memory effectively. And so you, for me, I was able to get um, kind of in a position where I can learn stuff really quick, maybe not to the point of expertise. Expertise takes time, uh, time, no matter where you go. Um, you know, I worked, I've worked with cryptography for, um, eight, almost nine years, actually about nine years, uh, cause I still use it today, but, um, you know, there's still a lot. I don't know about it. Uh, I don't know a lot of the, the mathematics things behind it. Um, and, and I'm totally okay with that, but, um, you know, that, that takes time. Um. So, you know, starting at an entry level job, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and, you know, finding somebody to act as a mentor or somebody that you can bounce stuff off of, that's super helpful. Especially if you find somebody that uh, is willing to do that for you. You kind of have to handle that well um, because you want to be respectful of that person and their time. So I'll give you a real world example. Um, somewhere in the middle of my career, career, I developed a relationship with a guy that uh, he is actually a cryptographer. So he's been to school the number of years that it takes to learn all the mathematics. And, uh, you know, he, he learned his way. He worked his way to that. Uh, I believe he has a PhD. Somewhere close to that, if nothing else. Uh, so he can break down the, you know, the mathematical items of like, you know, 
I'm probably going to butcher the name, Euler, Euler's Totion, Euler's Totion, I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's an element in RSA, um, mathematical thingy. Uh, he, he could break that down and tell you how that actually functions in there. Um, so I developed a relationship with him. Uh, I would come up with some items that I needed to ask him, but I wouldn't send the email right away. And usually I'd keep it to an email. Uh, exclusively to an email. Um, and I would work that email so that it was super efficient so that I was using his time as efficiently, efficiently as possible, uh, not wasting his time and not abusing that relationship. But you know, it might be like two or three questions. So if you can find somebody that can kind of help you uh, sort out the non-technical components of your career or learning, because there's the, the term that comes to mind is context somebody that's actually been through it kind of knows the ropes of the, the area or whatever. So that's helpful as well. Um, but I think it's really just, for me, it was really just that, uh, just picking up the next task and pushing the needle down the road and um, using experience that I've picked up previously to, to move forward, building relationships along the way. So, kind of talked about that a little bit with uh, the guy that actually has a lot of education in cryptography, but, um, you know, building those relationships with people, not just there to suck the life out of you and leech off of you, but, you know, like, how's your family? How's stuff going here? What's new in your world? Yeah. Stuff like that. So relationships are really big because who you work with, um, you know, like we used to work together. And so we're here talking and, um, we'll probably chat a little bit after the deal here because I'm just not all about just the business or anything. So um, I imagine I rub some of my guests the wrong way because I actually do that. Like I'll be like, Hey, let's do the interview. <laughs> and then we do the interview and then I'll talk for like five minutes afterwards. And then do... I'm kidding. <laughs> I've never gotten that reaction yet. But... What's what's going on? <laughs> man? Yeah. CW for say you left me hanging. What's up, man. It's just, I'm kidding. <laughs> But no, I, I agree. I, I think um, I, I think finding a, a good mentor is, is incredibly important because I kind of talked about um, uh, my mentor a little bit in, in a previous video. So I facetiously call him Sarah. Um, so the That's the very my wife's name. <laughs> you know my wife. Stop it, Cody. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. So uh, Sarah C E R A. Um, oh. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, the, the very first day that I met Sarah, um, my desk was like in complete disarray the, the morning that I walked in and I was like, I was really upset. I was looking around. I was like, Hey, who messed up my desk? And then, um, someone, someone had, had said, Oh, uh, you know, that was probably Sergeant Sarah. So I was like, I'm going to go find this Sergeant Sarah and I'm going to ask him why he messed my desk. Up. And then, um, he uh he made he raised me he raised me uh with with an insult and it, it was pretty good he he called me uh, I don't I don't want to say it on, on on YouTube but it was it was not nice but it was incredibly funny at the same time and we've just been kind of like Darth Vader and El Emperor Palpatine ever since just nonstop action nonstop fun nonstop learning so yeah I, I agree I think finding finding a mentor that works for you especially is like um not not every mentor is is going to work for you you know like there's going to be some yeah. they'll try and you know it, it just doesn't work out for whatever reason I, I don't think I've ever met someone who was like intentionally like I don't know, misleading or malicious with, with their mentorship. I, I've never met anyone like that. Yeah. And, and, you know, different strokes for different folks. Everybody's got a different personality. Um, and you just kind of have to feel it out and be okay with, you know, if they're not super into that or super relational or anything. Um, you know, it might be a case where that person has just got a very – um, you know, to use the disc model, the, the D personality. And then, you know, that's the only thing that they got is just that. And then 110% of the day, they're just focused driven. They'll give you just the shortest answer possible. And, you know, I have met some folks that are, it's not intentional to be that way. 
that's just who they are and they don't mean anything by it. They thought yeah. they were being nice. It's like, no, you're really kind of a jerk. And I really don't like coming to you for questions. And so now we're having a heart to heart, <laughs> but um, you know, the big thing you get from that is like, you know, you take this book. Okay. Understanding cryptography, um, you know, lots of funny symbols in here. Uh, you know, you could take that and try to read it or you can go in, you know, there might be some stuff you understand in there, but maybe there's a thing in there you don't understand. Trying to Google search that or research it on their own when you, you could just send an email to somebody and be like, hey, what what is this thing? And so this actually was something that happened in a conversation with me and a uh, cryptographer guy was, uh, oh yeah, it means this. Cryptographers like to make up mathematical symbols and then not put a legend anywhere in the book. <laughs> oh. Okay, well, you know, that kind of helps because uh, you can't really go to Google and say, I, I, I can't draw this symbol. Do I do like a reverse image search? I don't know. I, do I kind I of have that? to laugh at that because I, I see a little <laughs> bit of a similarity there with InfoSec. So, like, sometimes people complain about pen testers writing reports, you know, for the target audience of other pen testers. I kind of imagine <laughs> there's probably something similar in, in the field of mathematics where mathematicians are like, writing documentation that only other mathematicians can understand. So I, I, funny joke, funny joke. I, I don't think that's, I don't know how much weight that carries though. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think everybody's got their own like lexicon of things or, um, you know, just tribal knowledge. That's the word I'm looking for. Tribal knowledge. They bring to the table, different pockets of InfoSec or whatever. Um, that, you know, it just, you get used to it because the folks you work with understand it and you don't realize somebody outside may not understand it. Cryptography being a very niche field, it's extremely bad there because there's just new stuff popping up all the time. And it might be something that I haven't, I just haven't ever seen before. It's been around since like, you know, RSA built their thing and back in 1976 or something. So it's a, it's a thing. All right. And it, it's difficult. Yeah. Um, if you were to recommend, you know, some some concepts, I guess, about cryptography and how that might relate to um, you know, maybe maybe someone trying to get into the field of pen testing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would kind of expect I would kind of expect a junior pen tester to have a, at least like a little bit of knowledge in that space. Maybe definitely not like you know like a collegiate level understanding. I definitely wouldn't expect that. But um, what, what do you think are some some concepts for you know, the, the more junior crowd to, to really understand, you know, at least before they you know start deep diving. Yeah. As far as cryptography goes, yeah. just general terms. Okay. Um, yeah. Just understand what asymmetric and symmetric means. So, um, you know, asymmetric is going to relate to um, like uh, an RSA key pair. So two keys uh, used for different operations. So one, the public key used to do public operations, uh, encrypt and validate signatures and then the private keys used to uh, perform private operations so decrypt and sign uh, and then your symmetric is really just one key um, to do both operations uh, encrypt and decrypt so you know understanding asymmetric and symmetric um, and then I think just how digital certificates work. If you can get like those two areas figured out, um, they kind of bleed into other things and you'll go a little bit deeper. But I kid you not, the first training course I took, the um, guy giving it, he kept using symmetric and asymmetric. And I thought, I have no idea what this guy is talking about. I got no idea. <laughs> um and I had to go look it up afterwards. And there was a number of terms. I was like, I have no idea what that is. I have no idea what that is. Um, so anyways, I, I have a tendency to just jump in the middle. Um, but it, starting out with those terms and how digital certificates are used um, and just, just really at a high level, how do digital signatures work? Um, just understanding how the importance of that and like code signing and then the security assurances that that provides. Because there's a lot of, stuff going on and you know the real world as far as data breaches go um, really just you look at some of these things and it's like wow that was really 
that was really a thing. You know, cellar winds comes to mind. Um, some of that could have been, a lot of that could have been avoided if they were doing um, digital signatures on their uh, commits. Um, at least I believe. Uh, I don't think they were doing it in that space. But so applying it, I'm going to get off in the weeds, but, you know, kind of learn in those few areas. Um, I think that'll be a really good foundation just to keep to like a short two or three. Yeah. And I would agree because, um, you know, I, I remember being a, a, a young lab builder and I remember buying like some, uh, some crappy access point from, from the, the local BX good old base exchange. And, um, I, I remember setting up a uh, web on it. And, you know, this was like, I don't know, like 10 years ago when WEP was sort of relevant, I guess. Um, <laughs> it feels like forever ago. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, I, I remember I remember kind of opening up Aircrack NG for the first time and pulling out a WEP key. And I remember seeing the, the term initialization vector and I was like, what on earth is an initialization vector? Like one that sounds really cool. And on the other hand, like, I kind of, like, it sounds cool, so I kind of want to know what it is and what it does. And that was really, like, my intro to the world of cryptography was from playing around with air crack on some random access point that I bought. So, and that really opened up the world. In, so it started out, you know, initialization vector, and then it got into, you know, symmetric and asymmetric encryption, and then uh, public key infrastructure and all this stuff. But, you know, I'm kind of curious... Uh, I'd like to get your perspective on this. So they're uh, not necessarily in a work context, um, but, uh, you know, there there will be, like, there'll be challenges and CTFs that I'll come across, and I'll see, like, a, a given application is set up in, in a manner where there's, like, pre-shared keys being stored in environment variables and, you know, like, cr like full-on credentials being stored in environment variables and... People will kind of throw that out as being like a workaround uh, for hard-coded credentials within the application itself. And I'm just saying, I'm like, well, you didn't hard-code it in the application, but it's still on the system. Like, it's still on disk and plain text. Like, I'm kind yeah. of curious um, if you think there's maybe a better way to approach the, uh, the, the kind of hard-coded credential sort of conundrum, because... You know, the, there's ways to, I, I can imagine, that would be good, and, and there's implementations that I can see being absolutely atrocious, like storing pre-shared keys and environment variables. Oh, yeah. The, the environment variable is a really bad idea for a key just because, you know, that's that's in the memory. So you're, you're one remote access bowling away from getting in there and dumping stuff in memory. Hey, what's this? Uh, anyways, um, yeah, there's... Really, a w the way a lot of people rec or a lot of technologies recommend is using some sort of um, process to call it on demand. Um, you want to keep that key, um, that cryptographic key. Actually, I'm I'm kind of blending two worlds here. Uh, I'll talk about the other world in a second, but um, specifically for like a cryptographic key, uh, you want to stick that in. A, a piece of technology that's uh, specifically for managing cryptographic keys, so like a hardware security module, um, or you know, hardware security modules are expensive. And there's a lot of cloud-based solutions today because a lot of people are using cloud um, that are kind of a. I was trying to think like the best analogy I got off the top of my head is like a writer application. So Azure uses Azure Key Vault. It's actually an app that sits on top of a gigantic HSM farm that Azure deploys globally. So you can get basically an HSM service through Azure for pennies on the dollar. Um, now what that does is it takes that key and it moves it into a solution where you got to authenticate to it each time. And, and pull it on demand. Um, and you don't actually pull it over to the system. You pass over whatever data you want to encrypt, decrypt, or sign to it. It does it and then spits back the result. So it's kind of like your uh, secure enclave on an iPhone. Uh, all your keys and everything are actually in this separate set of silicon on that device. And it 
will pass info to it, the processor will pass info to it, and then it'll just get back the result. That's a really good design um, if implemented properly. Uh, same thing with the uh, like secrets, because that's kind of in the same space. You want to call those on domain. You don't want to keep those on the system um, any more than you absolutely have to. Sticking stuff in environment variables, um, typically that stuff's going to stay there in memory while the application's running. Um, it's not on the disk, but it's still in memory. Uh, I don't think that's a whole lot better, to be completely honest. Maybe just like a smidge, but not very much. <laughs> So we had talked about um, you know, kind of your career path um, and different advice that you had given for people interested in you know starting their infosec journey, uh, mentorship and or finding a mentor and um, not being afraid of taking those entry level jobs and you know, building up a, a strong foundation for your future. And we've talked about cryptography a little bit. Let's kind of talk a, a little bit about um it kind of in a loose sense like your day to day um so what uh what would you say really differentiates what you currently do from you know kind of like traditional network pen testing yeah um specifically coal fire um it, if you don't want to talk about that that's cool but, I'm yeah. just, I, I was making sure that I understood you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, your current role and how it kind of differentiates from the more traditional kind of pen testing roles. Oh, yeah. So uh, working in consultancy, um, I haven't been doing it a very long time, but a lot uh, different than I think the traditional. Uh, you're going to be dealing with a, a wide range of customers. So, um, you know, you're going to be dealing with different uh, folks in different you know, segments, let's say like six to eight weeks for a typical engagement, um, depending on what you're doing. And then there's a couple different service offerings that you've got. So you might do um, you know, web application assessment. Uh, you might be working on assisting with best practices. So like documentation and foundational pieces for an organization. Um, and then uh, there's probably a couple others just haven't really encountered it. Um, I think the the biggest thing is just you know kind of that revolving door of of projects and working with different folks. That's an element that's exciting to me because it's a uh, it's not super uh, standardized, I guess. So you know every organization's different, so that's a different set of challenges, and it, it's just change on a revolving basis. And I think that's something I like. I, I don't like for I would never survive as a um, assembly line worker putting rivets on something all day, every day. I need kind of a change of scenery. So that that's something that's uh, appealing to me. Um, but yeah, so you know, a couple of different things you might be working on. The documentation pieces uh, and working on best practices. That's a little bit different um, in the sense that you know it's not hands-on trying to find bones and something and write a report. Um, that's a lot of governance, that's a lot of understanding, how do I make documentation that's, um, uh, you know, helpful to somebody. Uh, so the way I write those is typically making things actionable. Uh, NIST is not something, well, NIST has a lot of really smart people and they write really good documents, but you're not gonna be able to take something like that and throw it at somebody. You need to distill it down into, things that are helpful to people. So that's kind of a, a theme I try to plug in every one of those I do. Like, here's something that's helpful. Here's something that's helpful. Um, not something that's so highly prescriptive that like, I don't know what this guy's talking about. Did I answer your question with that? Um, More or less, yeah, I, I think so. So, um, you know, like I, I kind of imagine um, for for a consultancy role, like you said, you, you kind of have that revolving door sort of mentality with projects where you're constantly bringing in new ones and, um, you know, kind of packaging up the old ones as, uh, as the new projects come in. Um, mm -hmm. and that varies significantly from what I do. Um, I, I'm kind of, I don't, I don't necessarily want to talk about it at the moment, but it, there's, there's a lot more, um, 
coordination that needs to happen before uh, before an engagement for me can can kind of come to fruition. So um, very, very interesting perspective on that note. And I think maybe there might be some people out there that will think, you know, maybe I'd like to go more consulting than than I would be internal, um, you know, maybe a more lively kind of workflow versus, um, you know, maybe maybe a slower one, one that takes a, a little more forethought and uh well i wouldn't say more forethought but um definitely one that takes more planning and and working around the needs of the business yeah because kind of understanding both sides of that dynamic um i i'd never worked in consultancy before and i was with an organization as an internal employee for 12 years so (laughs) completely different uh change in that regard um you know when you're an employee for an internal organization um yeah you're gonna it's gonna be the same environment and the same kind of set of rules for, um, you know, the lifetime of that organization or length of your there. Um, with consultancy, yeah, you're, um, uh, you do have a lot of, it's kind of a, you know, if you don't like the scenery, you stay on the bus, it'll change in a couple of miles. It's kind of that kind of, kind of thing. Um, which was immediately appealing to me just because you get that, um, that change but i like uh, i don't like for things to be static i want new challenges um on a semi-regular basis so i don't want to get bored that's kind of what i'm getting at so definitely some some big contrasts there uh consultancies i'm i'm liking it so far so that's cool but yeah yeah and you know the different strokes for different folks kind of like what you were saying before one yeah. style of you know kind of workflow might be better for others than some um whereas it might be the flip side for um you know other people it, it it's it's a weird world you know everybody kind of has their their own drives their own motivations and there there's really no wrong answer you know you can have a happy successful life no matter what you choose to do um yeah absolutely i i, I definitely think there's a little bit of you know wisdom that one kind of needs to uh to kind of achieve that effect because you know like i i imagine if i was homeless tomorrow i don't think i'd necessarily be ha- living like a happy and fulfilling life you know <laughs> not not <laughs> yeah, for absolutely. not for the foreseeable future anyway so um what um what's next for you uh what are some cool projects or maybe maybe some some interesting things that you're uh well not necessarily like for work but you know just in in a general context what are some some cool projects that you got going on or you know some some things that you're working on the side yeah so immediately the thing i'm trying to get through is the oscp path on try hack me um there's a lot of a lot of good information in there that i need to do the long term goal is oscp um the interim goal uh i think i'm gonna work on taking the uh it's the cyber mentors practical network pen testing training and certification um i haven't done a certification since my a plus i'm 35 now and that was when i was a junior in high school so that's been a minute (laughs) um so you know, that's kind of a, a mode that you got to get into. December is a horrible month to get into something, so I'm definitely not doing it this month. Um, but that's why I stay busy with things like Try Hack Me. Um, I can get in there, work on something for 40 minutes if I got that amount of time, um, put it down and pick it up in a day or two. That's kind of the way schedule works a little bit right now. Um, but, you know, those two certifications are definitely the the ones I'm, I'm working toward. Um, you know, working in uh, web application pen testing specifically and, and application security. Um, something else I want to do is a Burt Suite, Burt Suite certification. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, they uh, they had an awesome Black Friday sale recently. Uh, you can yeah. get the, the exam voucher for nine bucks. I did not because <laughs> I didn't know when I could take it. And I think it was in the middle of something and it just it went to the back of my mind. And then I thought about it after it had expired. I was like, well, oh no, yeah. 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 So I was like, oh, oh well, whatever. It's, it's not that big of a deal. Um, you know, those two certifications are um, kind of, I believe there's things in there that kind of bleed over into a lot of different areas. So that's kind of why I want to take those before, uh, doing 
anything else. Uh, those are the immediate projects I'm working on. I'm trying to structure those in a way with a good work-life balance. Um, I have to strategically plan it. And January is usually a good month to start something for me because it's right after Christmas. Um, it's cold outside. Nobody wants to do anything. So I can usually find a pretty good regimen where maybe I work on something Tuesday, Thursday nights. Um, I don't really like to do stuff on the weekend because by that point in time, I need to step away from the screen for a while. Um, I like to do stuff with the family or whatever. Um, and just take a break from computer or work stuff. So trying to find that, that work-life balance and, and stick to that. You know, going back to my very um, obsessive nature of reading about things and researching, um, you know, that can lead into some not so happy lifestyles for me where maybe I'm doing something six days a week. That's not a good schedule for me. So I've got to really be th uh, thoughtful about how I plan those out and not uh, get super crazy and get like burnout on it or something. Um, I burned through the cyber thing and then I kind of just put that whole thing on back burner for like seven or eight months because I burned through the hundred some hours pretty quick, um, way quicker than they uh, suggested. Not a great idea. Don't don't try to just brute force through something. Um, you'll get tired of it. Stick it on the back burner. You may not come back to it. So, yeah. Um, we have two minutes left on the call. I, I don't know if there's going to be a pop up or something asking me to extend it. Um, okay. But if it if it doesn't close out, I'm totally cool with staying on. Um, so I'm going to try and kind of wrap this up as quick as I can. Um, okay. So, um, you know, as we bring this towards a close, um, you know, what do you foresee changing in, in the next five to 10 years in the field? And that could be anything. Good gosh, that's a big question, Cody. Uh, you know, I'm sitting over here looking at this book I read about DARPA. So there's something in there that comes to mind. Um, it, people got a real focus on AI and machine learning. Um, I'm a little bit more practical on things. Uh, some people are on the extreme that they think that's going to like overtake and, um, you know, uh, Skynet's going to come out of it and we're all going to be, <laughs> I'm going to be looking for John Connor and the laser gun somewhere. Um, I, this I'm is all powered by that. the one true cloud. Yeah. <laughs> Azure. Yeah. It's definitely going to be Azure. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm definitely not worried about that. I, I think you're going to see a lot of folks uh, or, you know, a lot of nation state probably already happening. It's going to be augmented for um, finding patterns and things that lead to um, the kind of the next level of, uh, you know, offensive tactics, um, things like that. Something I'm curious about that I haven't seen a whole lot of is um, using machine learning around evaluation of ciphertext. So I had a thought one time that if you could take machine learning and train it on a specific um, encryption pattern for uh, a given cryptographic key, that if that key was ever leaked anywhere, um, you could find it. So that's kind of my thoughts on that, is you could use it as a way to find cryptographic keys that have been leaked. So not necessarily brute forcing a cryptographic key, but finding it just in the wild somewhere. Um, that's more of a situation where somebody accidentally posted something to GitHub and they're actively using it to um, encrypt data so you could find it that way. Anyways, um, you know, AI, machine learning, I think we're gonna see some next level Tactic, tactics and techniques and procedures being developed out of that that's going to be um, pretty crazy. Uh, I'm curious to see how that works, and that's probably something I want to study up on after I get through OSCP. It's really hard not to call that OSCP, which is a PKI term, yeah. so I had to <laughs> no. really think about it each time. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, it always throws me off whenever I see that on certificates, so CSP, I'm like, Wait a minute. It's really easy to transpose <laughs> those two letters. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, as we 
kind of bring this toward a conclusion, um, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing your perspective and your experiences and advice with all of us. And I think there's, there's going to be some people, I, I think, that will be a little surprised to hear your story and what you've been able to accomplish. But I want these people to understand you don't need a degree. You don't need a specific <laughs> certification. You don't need to do it, you know, X, Y, or Z. You can just be you and you know live life on your terms. And as long as you're you know kind of putting guardrails on things, right? You don't want to do literally anything that you know comes to your mind. Kind of got to put some guardrails on things from time to time. But as long as you live life on your terms, I, I think you'll be all right. Yeah, if you're gonna be a medical doctor, you do gotta go to college for that. I don't want you operating on me with uh, you know <laughs> <Yeah>. no degree. <laughs> you got my yeah, surgery man. certification from Microsoft Azure. Kidding. China. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank thanks for having me on here, dude. I, I really appreciate you um, setting this up and taking the time. So it's definitely an honor to be on here. Yeah. And I'm sure there's uh there's probably gonna be some people offline be like, Hey, I saw you on blah 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 and Okay, so to those people, no conspiracy going on. Matt and I have been friends for many years now. When did we first meet? Um, it was probably like three or four years ago at a work conference, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was a work conference. And then uh, I think shortly after that, I, I called you up one day. I was like, so I think I want to make this career change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just picking your brain about it. But yeah, we've known each other for couple of years about to start my uh you know i want to go into offensive security see what this is about journey yeah. so it's been super cool to see you grow and achieve your goals it's really been awesome man um you know as, as a final thing where where can people find you where can they reach out to you what are some good links yeah so i don't I don't have a lot. You can hit me up on Twitter uh, at mfoster86, super, super plain Jane. Um, and then you can also email me. I'm a Gmail, uh, fosterfarian at gmail.com. Um, I'll let Cody spell it out. It's a nickname somebody gave me one time and uh, has stuck with me through the years. So so there you go. You can you reach me on either one of those. Well, all right. Thank you so much once again, Matt, for sharing your, your perspective and your experiences and your advice with all of us. And um, for the rest of you, I apologize for not putting out content, especially content that I said I was going to put out and didn't. It will get out eventually. Patience, please. Patience. Um, actually, I don't think there's anyone like dining at their keyboard like CW if it's like what are you gonna start putting out I don't think I don't think that person exists right now but um oh he exists he's over here <laughs> <laughs> but um for those of you who uh who have realized your ultimate calling in life to serve the one true cloud and it's destiny for all of us to merge as one on the day of singularity ladies and gentlemen go ahead hit those like and subscribe buttons um, check out Matt Foster on Twitter and his email will be in the description below. And once again, thank you all so much for joining us and we'll catch you all in the next one. <laughs>